Coming up on Inside Lehman, so much to say and to struggle to say it. We'll show you how people who stutter have won their own personal war of words with some expert help. Travel with us to Hiroshima, Japan, where a global peace conference looks at the state of our world and what needs to be done. Plus, filling in the gaps in the timeline of human evolution. We'll show you a new high-tech tool that can help unravel some of evolution's mysteries. So sit back and relax, because Inside Lehman starts now. Hello and welcome to Inside Lehman. I'm Maurice Mercado. And I'm Alicia Reed. Imagine knowing exactly what you want to say, but having to wage a battle within yourself just to utter the words. Finding expert help is the answer. And Inside Lehman's Lou Gonzalez has the story. Millions of Americans struggle with a problem that isolates them from the world. It is called disfluency, but most of us know it as stuttering. Feels like my throat is filled with either like cheese or peanut butter or something and I just can't break through. Um, I know everything I want to say, I just can't say it at times. For years I ordered Sprite in restaurants because that was easier for me to say than Coke. So I would order a Sprite and then it would come to the table and my mom would be like, why aren't you drinking your Sprite? And I'd start crying because I was so frustrated. Most people who have disfluency begin to stutter at a young age. It has been discovered that stuttering can be linked to genetics, but there are still many unanswered questions about the causes of stuttering. We have to retrieve our words and put them in a certain order, and then it's all expressed through this physical system. So somewhere along that line, it could be a signal system, a combination of signal systems just is not working properly in the person who stutters, and it creates this disruption in the physical flow. Catherine Montgomery is the executive director of the American Institute for Stuttering. While currently there is no cure for stuttering, the Institute provides intensive treatment for those who have disfluency. So first step in therapy is to get out there. Let yourself stutter, let, let it show, tell people, forewarn them, hey, hang on a second, you can see I stutter sometimes, give me a second here, that sort of thing. And I tell you, that's such a foreign concept to so many people who come here. They said, are you kidding? Tell people this thing I've been trying to hide my whole life. The clients go through what is called self-advertising. They go to a heavily populated area and talk with complete strangers. This is an exercise to help them get past the shame of stuttering and accept it so they can move on to changing their speech. See, the good news is they've got all the parts. The muscles are intact. And if they're working with a good coach, you know, they can be, they can learn how to get their muscles working in a more synchronized fashion, which creates the fluidity or the fluency in speech. The Institute is a safe haven for those who stutter. It's a place where they are free to be themselves without the judging stares and comments of society. This intensive pr program was a relief in so many ways to be able to just immerse yourself completely in the program. Catherine's work produces dramatic results. My attitude with my speech now is greatly improved. How so? Well, my fear of everything is gone. Um, if I do ask for anything, I'll just ask it. I feel like I just, it's almost like learning another language. <laughs> it's, it's a new way of speaking, really. And it's so much more relaxed. I don't have headaches at the end of the day. It's awesome. <laughs> Lehman College master's level students who are studying to become speech language pathologists often intern at the American Institute for Stuttering. This allows them to put the knowledge they have learned in the classroom to use. We have to give our students a wide variety of experiences so when they go out into the field they have experiences dealing with speech and language problems. But working with a person who stutters as, co as opposed to reading a textbook on people who stutter was a vast uh, difference. Um, the people who, that you work with are real and they stutter and what, implementing a program 
with them and watching the difference within three weeks yeah. was amazing. What Catherine Montgomery and the Lehman students do at the Institute is clearly producing results. A letter given to Catherine by a former client sums up the impact of their work. I entered this program a beaten down mess who was on the verge of giving up all hopes of ever being happy. Now I leave a confident person who is looking forward to what life has to offer. How can you not feel fantastic about that, helping people to get to that point? Lou Gonzalez, Inside Lehman. In these times of international tension and changes in the global power structure, organizations focused on global citizenship are reaching out to make a difference. Inside Lehman takes you now to Japan for a look at the Global Peace Conference co-sponsored by Lehman College. This is modern-day Hiroshima, a city where history speaks vividly about the need for peace. It is a thriving city, but there are still powerful reminders of World War II. The memorials and the few buildings that remained standing after an atomic bomb shook the earth on August 6, 1945, remind us of the many lives lost. Fire rained from the sky over this place, now known as Peace Park. Hiroshima's mayor leads Mayors for Peace, an organization of more than 1,300 member cities worldwide. I hope you will help us in increasing the number of cities that join the Mayors for Peace, thus uh, achieving a short-term goal that we have, which is preventing a third use of nuclear weapons within a few years, and the mid-term uh, goal of abolishing all nuclear weapons by the year 2020. Working toward that goal and other efforts to achieve world peace brought everyone together at a three-day conference entitled Building a Just and Sustainable Peace. Lehman College joined with a coalition of international institutions and organizations seeking to improve education, health, the environment, and social equity. Let us remain determined to offer an alternative vision and to create the path through our institutions and organizations to achieve that vision. For each of us at this conference, working for peace is an intrinsic part of who we are and what we represent. Nobel Peace Laureates Jody Williams of the United States and Shirin Abadi of Iran have each achieved worldwide recognition for their efforts to improve global understanding. Williams helped found the international campaign to ban landmines. I feel particular responsibility to speak out against those policies of my country that directly contradict the mythology of the United States as being a beacon of hope, democracy, and all things good in the world. It is a myth, and many of us are fighting to make the myth reality, but we can't do it alone. Lehman students discuss the future of our global community with their fellow students from Japan. Lehman graduate Alice Michelle Augustine worked with the Commission on Human Rights and Administrative Justice in Ghana. She recalled a friend who lived with a family that had a young girl working in domestic servitude. And Ama has become my obsession because in Ama's life, I see the possibilities for human rights and I also see the failures of a system that has not been created to enforce the rights that it has given people. Nobel Peace Laureate Shirin Abadi called upon everyone to reject the notion that peace is simply an absence of war. Living in poverty, violation of human rights, living in non-democratic societies, absence of freedom of expression and speech, absence of human security, damage, peace. Conference participants came together once again near the building known as the A-Bomb Dome to unfurl their individual contributions to a peace ribbon that expressed their support for a future of world peace. Christina Pagan, Inside Lehman. Evolution is filled with mysteries. While fossils provide evidence, there are still missing pieces that represent millions of years of development. Inside Lehman's Daisha Harold introduces us to the scientific process aimed at filling in those critical gaps. This is what paleontology is all about. 
Small details matter in this dig in Sinead's friends that seeks to uncover the past by unearthing remnants of ancient and often extinct forms of life. While it is interesting to know about the recovery of fossils, there can be challenges in figuring out what ancient relatives may have looked like. Professor Eric Delson specializes in the research of human history and what are believed to be our early primate relatives. We're looking at ways to try to understand variation and change through time or evolution. And that's all evolution really is, is just change in a structure through time. What about the fossils connecting the timeline from millions of years ago to more modern forms of life? Many of them remain undiscovered. Professor Delson, chair of the Lehman College Department of Anthropology, heads up a project to figure this out. This is a project which allows us to try to reconstruct what ancestors might have looked like when we know the living forms. We can trace our way backward from living primates to what their ancestors might have looked like. This is where computer technology helps. Scientists are able to mark reference points on an ancient skull and then compare it to similar points on a more modern sample. If I measure the distance across the eyes, the distance between the eyes, the height of the face, the distance across the brows, the length of the skull, they're just distances. It doesn't tell me as much about the shape of the whole skull because each distance is separate. With geometric morphometrics, what we do is choose a bunch of points on the skull and locate their three-dimensional position in space. We can then build a model which just draws lines between those points, and then we can compare those models from one kind of animal to another. Other components of the project include work by students and a printer, but not your normal office printer. Instead of ink, it uses plastic. What we can do with an image such as this is uh, that we can actually physically print it out. So we've gone from living animals that we've scanned in, using a laser scan, we've scanned in their skulls, we've worked out what the ancestors looked like, we've calculated it, we've created a model, we've visualized it here using this software, and then finally with the machine behind me, we've actually are able to print it out. The machine sprays hard plastic around a soft inner material that can then be washed away when the model is complete. Working with bones all the time, you, you do wonder what some of the skeletons would look like if they were complete. And this machine enables us to make models of those missing types of specimens and we can actually visualize in 3D what it would actually look like. The level of detail in the 3D models is very high. It can take up to 16 hours to produce an object depending on its size. For researchers, it's worth the wait as they work to shine a spotlight on some of the hidden secrets of our world's ancient past. Daisha Harold, Inside Lehman. Livia Bin Jackson has a remarkable story of survival and a deep insight on human history as a Holocaust survivor. As an author and professor of Judaic history at Lehman College, she looks back at painful years in the Auschwitz concentration camp and shares her thoughts on what humanity has learned from its sometimes brutal past. When I first came in the United States, um, people in general didn't want to hear what happened in Europe. Uh, maybe it has to do with a sense of guilt because they didn't help us, there was nothing done for us. Those who read my books get it. This book I wrote, the title is I Have Lived a Thousand Years. I wrote this for youth. I had written an original book uh, many years before and the title of that was Ellie, which was my first name coming of age in the Holocaust. The young people have to learn about this, and so they should be able to understand it and connect with it. I come from a small town, but my brother was in Budapest, and he escaped as soon as he uh, realized that the Nazis marched into Budapest. 
the next morning the newspapers came out and there was nothing about an invasion of Budapest. The Jews immediately on the street were arrested and put into trains waiting at the stations and shipped and they didn't know where. But later we knew that they went to various concentration camps. It was dark outside and the train door opened and some men in striped uniform told us, out in German, raus, raus, alles raus. And I was with my mother and my aunt, my mother's sister. She was my favorite person in the world. And the three of us were in arm in arm. And finally we came to a halt. And there stood this fellow whom now we know was Dr. Mengele the famous angel of death of Auschwitz. He did the selection. With a stick in his hand, in his legs akimbo, he directed traffic. A friend of mine and her mother already were directed to the left. And another friend, and there were two girls with their mothers also to the left. So we didn't wait to be told by Mengele which way to go, but automatically we followed them in that same line. And as I was walking a few steps, Mengele noticed me because I was very tall for my age and I had blonde braids. And the blonde braid, that was the ideal for the Aryan girl. So he hit me over the head, called me back, come zurück. And I came back and he asked me, are you Jewish? And I said, yes, I'm Jewish. He took one of his braids in his hand and he was wondering, this was for an schöne golden hair, I asked him. What a beautiful golden hair you have, which was terribly frightening to me. What does he want from me? We are in a situation where everybody is panicky with fright. And here he takes his time out to admire my braids. And then he says to me, how old are you? And I said, I'm 13. He says, 13? Now, you go this way. Remember, you go to the right, but from now on, you are 16. Remember. He took my mother, shoved her to, to me, and said, you go with your daughter. And at this point, my aunt started to cry and scream hysterically. Laura, Laura was my mother's name. Please, don't leave me, don't leave me. So my mother wanted to go back to her sister. And he said, no, you go with your daughter. And Aunt Serena and started to run after us. And somebody gave her a shove, and she fell down. I said to her, Aunt Serena, I'll never see you again. And again they gave her a shove, and again she fell down. And that was the last I saw of my aunt. So all my friends my age and even a year or two older went straight to the gas chambers. They would be now grandmothers if they would have survived. So on the one hand, I'm very appreciative to God. And every morning I say a prayer, which is called Modeani. I thank you. I thank you, God, for everything that you have given me. I think that my life runs on love. I feel that I love most people. And that's the only way I'm able to, to go on. Lehman faculty and students host a gathering to take a hard look at the issues surrounding the September 11th attacks. The Lehman community examined a powerful documentary that put the September 11th attack under a microscope and raised troubling issues. A panel moderated by Lehman professor Miguel Perez hosted a viewing of the film entitled On Native Soil. Mary Fetchett, who was instrumental in the formation of the 9-11 Commission, says citizens need to be informed about terrorism and how our nation responds to the threat. It's going to go on for a hundred years. Uh, many generations are going to be dealing with this threat of terrorism. They're going to be dealing with the foreign policy issues. 
And, you know, the more informed and involved you can be, the better. Fetchit, who lost her son in the 9-11 attack, says Americans have a responsibility to educate themselves about key issues and play an active part in charting the course of our future. Miguel Garcia, Inside Lima. has become a powerful media source that provides serious competition for the more traditional radio and television media. It no longer takes millions of dollars to reach an audience. Inside Lehman's Barbara Torres tells us what it takes to get Lehman Sports on the web. No matter where you are, Lehman Net Radio Sports is just a mouse click away. Men's and women's basketball and other Lehman Lightning action now stream live on the web. This technology allows fans to listen in on the play-by-play -play commentary from any computer that is connected to the web. Rafael Bueno in for Morale as Marciano brings to Lehman 11 early in the first half. Of course, making the coverage of a sporting event easily accessible to computer users requires a lot of technology and planning. The play-by-play -play announcer also has to be up on the latest sports statistics to be able to provide meaningful commentary as the game progresses. We definitely have to go over the rosters and try to pronounce names right, get numbers, do all that on the floor, try to find out what the team did in the previous matches, find out who are the uh, people that they go to on the uh, court. As you might expect, it takes many steps to connect the production team to the web for their live coverage. Jerry Bernard, manager of Information Technology Resources at Lehman, explains how the audio stream works. First, we need to have the audio signal. That's usually a regular audio from a tape or a live or from whatever. Come over to uh, the uh, server where we have the uh, real video system on it. Real video, real video means also real media, anything, audio or video. And that is then encoded for the web by the system, by the server. And then uh, it can be streamed down on over the web. It would uh, make it much more convenient, save them time to drive to the campus to watch uh, uh, the performance of our home team. And uh, even though they can't really cheer uh, on site for the home team, but at least they can enjoy the wonderful performance of our, our uh, athletic team. It's just a fabulous thing to know that our fans could be home, they could be doing homework, they could be at their computers, they could be lounging around and listening to Lehman College basketball. It's just great for the fans. It's a fabulous feeling to know that Lehman College will be heard on the web in all four corners of the earth. It's just a great feeling. Great for the program. To listen in on the Lehman games, all you have to do is visit the Lehman College Athletics page and click on the sports webcast link. This way it takes you right into the game at any time. So even if you can't be there, you can tune in as the action happens. With webcasting in place, Lehman College Sports can now have coverage with a global reach. When you can't get to the game, why not let the game come to you? Let's go! The Lightning win! Barbara Torres, Inside Lehman. Picture a stage with only a grand piano and a bright spotlight shining on the singer and the microphone. A real test of talent and nerve to say the least. But when the performer connects with the audience, you can be sure that there's magic in the air. Inside Lehman's Melissa Rodriguez went behind the scenes to see how a group of emerging professionals recreated the time-honored cabaret tradition on a Lehman stage. Lehman College's production of Uptown Serenade, an elegant evening of song, brought together six singers. They each had to develop their own interpretations of American standards and classic soul songs. They had to find a way to reach their audience, many of whom were not yet born when these songs were first popular. range from the heat of Aretha Franklin's Natural Woman to the nostalgia of You'd Be So Nice to Come Home To. Dating back to the 19th century, 
cabaret-style performances began in Paris and usually took place in bars and nightclubs, providing an informal setting for artists, composers, and poets. Because that's how it was back in the 40s, and I always loved that intimateness because you could really look at the person's eyes and, and see the person's emotion. I don't know, I just feel so um, cozy and, and homey. It just feels like home, a stage. It's mm -hmm. my home. When selecting a song, the performers must depend on only two things, their voices and the piano. There is no orchestra to help hide mistakes. Many of the practice sessions involve going over and over the same notes with the pianist. Assistant director Henry Ovias explains that although the production might look simple, it takes a lot of preparation to recreate the understated atmosphere of a cabaret setting. Well, what we did this time is we wanted to add a couple of more people uh, to what we had, the, the second uptown serenade. So we wanted to keep it intimate, keep it in the studio theater, uh, basically just give people a piano and a microphone and an audience, uh, and which is obviously great for an audience to just be a singer that way. One question the students pondered was how much of their own personal style should be worked into the performance. They each had to find the line between adding their own personal flair to the performance and staying true to the song. Well, I've heard the song many times before, and I guess because of the limited amount of time, I listen to the original a lot to kind of get what goes where. But I think if we had more time, I might not, simply because it's, it's a little bit intimidating. This is a classic song, and I just want to do it my way. This was the third time that our production of Uptown Serenade had been presented, but even the singers who had appeared before tell us they still feel the tension when it's time to step up to the microphone. I'm not really nervous right now, but I guess when the day comes, you know, you get a little stage nerves. It gives an opportunity for the music department and the theater department to get together and work at what we do best. Uptown Serenade turned the theater into a cabaret for the evening, but of course, even with the best setting, talent, time, and commitment are essential in making the magic happen. The Uptown Serenade performers understood the challenge and met it. Melissa Rodriguez, Inside Lima. Well, that's our show. We'd like to thank our talented reporters and crew for their tremendous work. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next time for more news from Inside Lehman.